lecture is Modeling in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, taking place October 1st at 6.30 p.m. in the Contemporary Gallery with Speaker Dakin Hart. Curator of Contemporary Art here at the museum. It's great to have you here. And it's a real privilege tonight for me to introduce colleague Dakin Hart, who is one of the guest essayists for our book on the Ronald Condic project. Um, Dakin previously was assistant director at the National Sculpture Center in Dallas. He is now getting his PhD at the Institute of Fine Arts in New York. And most recently, he has co-curated a fabulously successful and important late Picasso exhibition that was at the Gosen Gallery. And his co-curator was the Picasso biographer, John Richardson, as I understand it. You're working on a part two also, so we can look forward to that. Uh, Dakin's going to take you through the exhibition tonight, and I um, hope you enjoy the ride. I'm sure it'll be a fabulous, um, engaging Talk. And I just want to thank you in public too for participating and being of course, here with thank us you. tonight. Having in addition me. to all the writing that you did. Thank you. Happy to be here. Welcome. Thank you. So I think the, the place to start really is, is to answer the question why we're standing in the galleries. Uh, to some extent that's self-evident, but um, I think it, it, it bears a little bit of explanation just why I would take you out of nice, comfortable lecture hall seats and why I would put myself in the position of not having slides to play with, which is what uh, art historians are accustomed to doing, working the side-by-side -side slide presentation. Um, and, and the reason really is, is because I want to talk about connoisseurship in a way, and, and connoisseurship is, is an old-fashioned idea. Um, it's, it's really not something that's in vogue, it's not taught, it's not practiced. Connoisseurship really is, is a science of close looking that developed in order for people to attribute objects that they knew were, knew were produced by somebody specific, but where the, the artist was no longer known. So people got very, um, built a number of, of theories about how to classify objects according to the details of the way they were made. And that was a way that, that lots of paintings were attributed to people like Rembrandt and lots of Italian masters were, were attributed and still are attributed. In fact, many of the attributions upstairs are based on the application of connoisseurship. And small regional collections like this are places that have collections that were built largely by connoisseurs. That is, people who were looking very, very closely at things um, and looking at things that supported that kind of close looking. And that, that's why it's an interesting concept to apply to a contemporary artist like Rona, because Rona's work is work that supports, it's very, very richly textured and has a very high, what I would call a very high level of resolution, which means that you can drill down into it and it keeps making sense and making more sense and making more sense. And the details of how it's made undergird and, and are in harmony with what the work, or some of the work's meaning, a lot of the work's meaning, many of the work's potential meanings. Um, so we're in, in the gallery because it's really, really important to be in front of the actual objects. And the, the, just a, as a point of contrast or comparison, um, I'll come back around to Dog at the end, but if, if we look at this piece on the first pedestal of, of uh, Rona's, the first plinth, compared to something like uh, Jeff Koons's Balloon Dog, or uh, even better, say, the, the Koons, does it, can everybody picture a Koons of some sort? Like, the, say, the Koons Lobster, Sort of, it's a it, it, Kunz's lobster is based on a, one of those floaty toys that you put in a swimming pool. It's about six feet long and it's it's bright orange and it looks like a, you would expect a kind of a cartoony blow up lobster to look. Well, Jeff Koons has a lobster that's part of an extended series he's done uh, based on sort of blow up toys of one kind or another, and it's it's a beautifully produced object in aluminum which has been painted. And in every single way, it looks identical to the blow-up plastic object, except that it's been made in aluminum and has been painted. 
And the difference between something like Akun's, which is part of a tradition that's based on linking the art object to common everyday commodities. Of course, it's, it's a descendant in the end from Duchamp and the idea of the ready-made um, by way of pop. So it's, it's, it's an extended critique on the, the, what you might call the, the, the market of art, um, the market for art. But those objects don't support close looking because at the end of the day, they resolve as an image. As soon as you know that the whole purpose of its fabrication, and its fabrication, by the way, is, is intensely industrial, it's made by the same kinds of people that you would go to get your, go to, to get your Porsche refinished. You know, it's like a body shop, essentially. Um, but this, the, the approach of industrial production, the point of it is to perfectly replicate the floaty toy. That's it. That's the intent. So it, it, the object itself is essentially a concept. And, and an image, a two-dimensional image, a slide, is totally adequate to describing the concept that's behind that object. That's not true of Rona's work. And it's not true of the works that Rona has chosen to surround herself with in the galleries. So that's why we're in the galleries. That's why we're looking at objects. And, and that's why I'm talking about connoisseurship, because connoisseurship is the study of paying close attention to things that were made uh, in, a, in a rich, deep, and highly textured way. So Rona has given a, a kind of a rubric for, for looking at these, um, these assemblies, these groups of objects. Um, and uh, like, like all artists, Rona is, is brilliantly elliptical. Um, and she's very good at, at hiding her candles under uh, various bushels. And uh, so she's, she's given us the idea of gesture and pose and hair and repetition. And the, these are obviously very general categories, um, quite vague, but I think part of the purpose of them is to get you looking closely. Um, I'm, I'm going to try to take you through these objects looking through a particular lens. And it's a lens that I share with Rona, but it's, it's one that she doesn't talk all that much about but uh, gives you some sense of, the again, the, the detail that's behind the choices that she's making. So I'm, the, that lens is, is the history of sculpture, or is really what, what I think of as the culture of sculpture. Cult, uh, every art form has techniques, traditions, certain ways of doing things, um, and that, that create a whole... Um, well, the reason to use the word culture is because it's, it's, it's sort of a vast assembly of, of things that go into making uh, what, what ends up being a, an ident a clearly identifiable way of doing things, looking at things. Um, so th this first group, I just want to talk uh, about scale and the, the idea of size versus scale because size and scale are not the same thing. Um, that's not something that a lot of, of sculptors these days pay much attention to. The balloon dog, again, I, I don't want to see like I'm picking on Coons, but he's a great example. And I love a lot of Coons' work. But um, the, the balloon dog, which is a sized up version of a twisted balloon animal, um, the scale of it is, is basically arbitrary. And from a photograph of it, unless you have context around it, you have no way of knowing what size it is from any internal clues. There are no internal clues. And in the end, it doesn't really matter. It, he made it big enough for, to make it really impressive, but it could have been twice as big or it could have been half as big and still have been essentially the same experience. Um, Rona, with Muskrat here, um, each of the bodies, um, these animal bodies, she's essentially sticking to something like life size for that animal. Um, with, some, with some adjustments here and there, um, expressive adjustments, but, but basically she's giving us a starting, taking as a starting point the size of the animal itself. Um, the, the choices she's making about how to describe um, the hybridization of animal and human parts all in the end comes down to obviously choices about scale. And what she's playing off against is the idea that's very, very deeply rooted in, in the history of sculpture of, the, of a canon. 
And that's, that's a sort of an ideal standard of beauty. Because hey, can everybody picture um, like a, a, a standing spear bearer? The Polyclitus, uh, a long time ago, a classical Greek sculptor, uh, created a, a sculpture that was known as the canon. And some people think that it was one of these spear bearers, or some people think that it was another sculpture of a, a victorious athlete tying a, a, a piece of cloth around his head, the diadumenos. But either way, these, these were uh, perfectly articulated male bodies with perfect idealized proportions, perfect musculature, um, and every, every proportion of those bodies is, is measurable. Um, and it, it happens that now with science, I don't know if, if you've read, read about this, but uh, there are scientists who are doing studies, for example, on, on bees, and it turns out that uh, the bees that end up mating with the, the queen are the ones that are the most perfectly symmetrical. And human beings also respond to perfect symmetry. Um, symmetry and beauty have a lot in common. Um, so there, there are all sorts of biological reasons that uh, canons work or make sense or are somewhat universal. What, part of what Rona is doing here, and, and the reason she's chosen these figures, none of which is, is anything even vaguely uh, approaching actual human proportions. Um, in fact, ironically, Rona's figure is the closest to ideal human proportions in terms of just height and just the proportion of head to body. Um, the, the average uh, head to body ratio is one to seven or seven and a half. In an idealized body, it's around one to eight. Um, and you'll see that in, in most cases, the proportion of head to body is, is much higher than that, that the heads are, are expressively large. Um, Rona has very consciously decided to go in exactly the opposite direction. And very interestingly as well, in, in each of these figures includes hands and heads, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about why. But uh, rather than scale the hands way down, which she does some places and sometimes, um, she's chosen just to abbreviate the hand parts as a way of continuing to get, without making it very, very weird looking, if she, she put full scale human hands, and I think these may actually be somewhat scaled down. I'll, uh, well, I take it back. I think these, these are perfect human scale. Um, she has been able to do that just, just by abbreviating to fingers, but obviously still getting that full effect and the full pose effect of, of hands pressed together. So the, the idea of a canon of beauty um, is one, as I said, that's sort of deeply ingrained in the, the history of sculpture. And one of the things that's interesting about sculpture versus painting is that sculpture's history is massively compressed in a way that paintings isn't. Um, sculptors, practicing sculptors, think about polyclitus. Practicing sculptors, think about the Venus of Lespoog, you know, the, the wonderful um, prehistoric Venus figures, the Hottentot Venus. There, there are dozens of them, literally. Um, they all fall into kind of a, a general category. They tend to look like fertility idols. Well, sculptors know those today. Practicing sculptors, contemporary sculptors, um, are engaged with the history of sculpture in a way that painters are not engaged with the history of painting. And there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, and the, the canon, Polyclitus's canon, is, is one of them. Because, but a lot of it just comes down to the survival rates, you know, the accidents of survival, that a lot more sculpture um, has survived than painting. There, there was monumental wall painting in classical Greece. All the public buildings were decorated with monumental wall paintings, panel paintings. They just haven't survived, um, whereas the sculpture has. But it's also because sculpture has been... Um, less collected, less, there are a million and one reasons for it. Sculpture's inconvenient, it's more expensive, it's hard to transport, it's hard to store, it's hard to install, it's expensive to install. There are a million and one reasons that any museum person could recite off to you um, that uh, there's just simply less sculpture. But it means that those high points are kind of more of an active part of a working sculptor's background or uh, just sort of background uh, mental furniture. Well, let's just move over here on this idea of an, an ideal of beauty because here um, Rona is very consciously playing with it at the same time that she's playing with another 
um, this is more of an artifact from the history of sculpture. A lot of the sculpture that's come down to us is broken for obvious reasons. But for, and, and now we have a much better sense of, of what was broken when and, and why and how and, and uh, when, more importantly, it was repaired. Because a lot of the most famous sculpture in history, especially obviously Greek and Roman sculpture, after it was dug up and had a chance to sit for a little while, uh, people who had uh, sort of taken on this concept of an ideal decided that it wasn't ideal for all of these Venuses to be missing their arms, and it wasn't ideal for all of these Apollos to be missing their feet or their noses or their heads or whatever they were missing. Um, and so they, they started uh, reassembling them. And often they went to what amounted to a bin of parts I mean, imagine these big digs, and they're pulling parts out of the digs. These parts all ended up in kind of central repositories, collections, important collections. And then sculptors would come along. There was a very famous one who's uh, one of my favorite characters, whose name was Cavaceppi in Rome in the 18th century, who reassembled some of the more famous sculpture and actually created some of the most famous uh, misinterpretations uh, lasting misinterpretations of sculpture. But th this figure here is a really great example because this head doesn't belong with the body. And the effect is, is nice in a way for someone like Rona because it creates a kind of a sense of the uncanny. Their proportions are, are quite off. Um, and they're off in a way that once you've looked at a lot of sculpture, you know, again, the proportions here are off, but they were intend intentionally off. They were designed to be off. The, the proportionality here is wrong because somebody has put together two things that didn't originally go together. And uh, they haven't been joined quite successfully. You can also see her, her neck. The way the, the neck is placed in, in the body is slightly off, off kilter as well when you look at her straight on, slightly off center. Well, Rona looks at these, these are, it, it, there's a, a term for this, it's known as pastiche. Pastiche means something else also, um, but it, it also refers to um, these, these assembled creations, or the process of assembling them. Um, and so Rona, in a way, is, is playing off of the idea of the pastiche in sculpture. This, I, I love this, this figure, this Pine Martin. Um, think of it as something like uh, uh, an alien in the year 2300 who is a, a, an artist, a sculptor, and they've been given a whole big pile of parts from Earth. Sculpture from Earth. And somebody decides that it's important to try to reconstruct these things and put them back together. And this is the kind of thing that they might come up with from, a, a, again, a bin of, of spare earth parts, um, trying to, to achieve something like an ideal of beauty based on whatever their alien physiognomy is. Um, just to, to show you, I think Rona's... Rona doesn't like to talk about meaning. Anytime you, start, anytime you ask Rona about meaning, she changes the subject. And uh, there's, there's a great interview in a fairly recent catalog where somebody starts to go down this road with her and she says, ask me something else about a technique. <laughs> and she just goes straight back into talking about technical issues. It's because uh, Rona, Rona is the kind of artist who has a, a, a cauldron of stuff churning away in her all the time, but she is, is um, very disciplined about not working from ideas. And uh, well, I'll talk more about that, but that doesn't mean that the ideas aren't there. It's just she wants them to come up through the work rather than imposing them top down on the work. And that, that's another, I think, a nice element of this, this connoisseurial approach to Rona's work is that you can drill down into them. The, the pine marten, it, as an animal, is related to the sable. It doesn't have quite as fancy a name, but a lot of sable coats were actually made of pine marten pelts. And when you start to look at this figure and its pose, for example, 
which feeds right into another terrific tradition, and not just in the history of sculpture, but the history of art, which is the reclining female nude. Rona's take on the reclining female nude, which is this, this languid uh, creature, but combined with a hand, which you could say is poking out of a sleeve, and it's, it's a pine marten skin sleeve. In a way, this hand is wearing a pine marten skin coat. And it's, it's, again, playing off conventions of beauty, conventional ideas of beauty, conventional ways that beauty is expressed in a cultural context. And, and what's so, again, so rewarding about her, her work is that without much work, you can usually find the cultural resonances uh, in them. Same thing with the cougar. Um, again, same part, uh, sort of participating in the same dialogue about a female beauty. Um, it's obviously, there, there's quite a lot of androgyny, but uh, I love the use here of, of the body and of course specifically her body. And uh, Rona is many things, but she is not a svelte beauty. Um, and the, the very frank, uh, perfectly uh, true human female arm as part of this uh, sort of sexy reclining construct, um, I think is, is, is uh, again, there's a lot of fantastic resonance there and, and playing against the notions of and, and canons of, of ideals of one kind or another, uh, be they historical or, or contemporary and current. Um, let's move over to this group. Um, Again, this, this one falls sort of generally under the rubric of pose, and that's, that's true, obviously. But I would say that th this entire group is, is about texture, the texture of sculpture, um, and materiality. Materiality is, is a hugely important issue, obviously. And uh, everybody who writes about Rona's sculpture is struck first by its physical presence, that when you're in front of it, the, the, sculpture, the individual sculptures have an enormous physical presence uh, and power, and, and also that uh, her sophisticated treatment and handling of materials. And every one of us who writes about her says something that relates to that and then acts surprised. And again, it's because Rona is, is working at every level of craft. And uh, here, what I, I love about this, because again, she puts it under the rubric of, of gesture, but really what she's given us, if you look at the two historical pieces of sculpture in her own, is she's given us two roots um, up for materiality. The, the, if you look at this Roman plaster mask, um, it's, it is, can, you, can anybody see, can you see the texture from where you are? It's, it's got a very porous texture because of the way the plaster dries. And, and there are plasters now that, that perform very, very differently. Um, but at the time, this, this is a very, very loose, porous plaster. And you end up with something that's, that's not unlike skin tone in a way. Um, it, he, he has pores, um, in a sense. Whereas the, the Rodin head, uh, bronze takes texture very, very well because when bronze sets, it expands. So it, it expands into a mold, which means that it picks up the details of a mold very, very accurately. And here, Rodin is specifically playing against that. L look how sort of waxy and generalized the texture of the head is. In fact, in, in this case, Rodin off often would take, because of the way he worked, he, he was a mad assembler, kind of a Dr. Frankenstein sort. Um, and he would often, in order to co consolidate an object that had been composed of many different parts, would dip them in plaster. And they would end up with like a skim coat of plaster that would unify all of the parts. But he also saw the expressive possibilities of doing that. And this, this head, it gives her a, a kind of a, an abstracted, dreamy quality because you don't get a lot of contrast between hair and skin, or the skin of the nose and the skin of the chin and the skin of the neck, which we know have all different textures, which we can see 
very, very evidently, very, very clearly in Rona's sculpture, which combines these two modes quite perfectly, in that she, she's taken what she saw here and she's pushed, pushed it to the extreme on either side by having this, this perfect silicon um, mold of her face which has picked up all of her skin texture and reproduced all of her skin texture and then combining it with this incredibly abstracted and generalized, uh, both, both uh, gen- generally as to the sort of underlying structure of the body, but also in its surface. You know, its surface is very smooth and very generalized. You don't get a lot, there, you get some sense of, of the, the musculature and bone structure underneath, but the skin itself is, is essentially untextured in much the, the way you, you get with Rodin. So, and those choices are obviously expressive and it, they're expressive in a way that's not unrelated to the expressions that she wants to pull out in putting these three things together and saying that they're under the general heading of gesture and pose. So it's, it's, there's, there's a, um, a material and textural uh, expressiveness that they share as well as just the you know, uh, human expression that we recognize. And that, that's typical of her. And it's, it's, it's nice that, that that kind of thing with her is often hiding out in, in plain view as it is with this group. Um, which leads to another subject, um, one that, that I'm really uh, interested in and really partial to, which, which is the, because it comes from Greek sculpture, um, which is the idea of anatomical precision. Greek sculpture, classical Greek sculpture, the best classical Greek sculpture, is recognizable because it is incredibly anatomically precise. I, I have a, a, a prof- had a professor, um, a specialist in Greek sculpture, who's also a dear friend of Rona's. And he once gave a, a class, a seminar I was in, 10 slides, and all the slides were... Um, different copies, presumably copies, maybe not copies, of heads of Harmodius and Aristogeiton, who were the the t- famous tyrannicides. Um, in some ways, they would be the uh, like the George Washingtons of ancient Greece, of classical Greece, because they eliminated the the tyranny that ruled Athens, which obvi- ultimately led to democracy in Athens. So they they were, for obvious reasons, much celebrated, much reproduced. Um, there was a famous pair of statues. Um, they're both uh, uh, male nudes. Um, and they, they were destroyed, and then they were remade, and they were remade again. And, then, and there are literally hundreds of copies of these things. So he gave us the heads and, and wanted us to take a stand and say whether we thought there was any possibility that any of them were original. And by original meaning classically Greek rather than Roman copies. And why? And every one of us had to write a, 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 a take on it, had to take a stand. And at the end of the day, what you realize is, is that, and we just had the heads and just slides of the heads. But what, what distinguishes Greek sculpture is that underneath the skin, you, un, you get the sense of musculature. One of the figures, uh, Harmodius is younger and the other Aristogeiton is older. And in Aristogeiton, you actually see in the best of them, the cheeks are a little bit sallower. You see a little bit of slump in the skin. You see the tightening up in the, the corners of the eyes. You see actual signs of physical wear and tear based on understandable um, physiognomy. They, they are, in other words, they, they have that same high degree of, of resolution. And um, what Rona is doing with, with these figures, the, the first one to look at, and, and this is worth a close look at some other Southern Brother point. I know it's hard for you all to come up to it, but this little bird figure, the eye is actually made of a, of a spiral. And um, if you think of this as a particular kind of bird, say something like a hummingbird, the shape of this eye, which is a, a, just a rolled up piece of, of clay, and 
this, this again goes back to habits of making, techniques of making. Um, a lot of making uh, clay sculpture involves rolling of one kind or another. The, the rolled clay loop is sort of like the basic building block of clay sculpture. And it's, it's used to build up uh, the walls of, of forms like this one very often. Um, they, those begin as stacks of rolls. And uh, so here we have something that's, it, it is acting as an eye, obviously, but it also looks just like a hummingbird's tongue. And it also happens to look like just one style of clay rolling. So it's, it's, a, it's an example of a, a sort of a, a beautifully precise but metamorphic uh, um, anatomical characteristic of bird. And um, if, if you can all try to get kind of um, end on to this, this pedestal, maybe kind of group, group that way or as you walk by, look at the way uh, Rona's otter leans. And she's leaning at an angle that's a little bit steeper than turtle woman. But uh, if, if you think about why, why do we have feet that stick out in front and only in front, there's a good reason for it. It's, it's because our mass, by and large, um, wants to go forward. And so the, the feet, obviously, are our props. They're what hold us up. But anybody who's standing just at rest, the way I am, if you look at them, there's always a slight forward body lean because that's a, a perfectly balanced position. And one of the neat things about sculpture, because it's in our space, because it exists in the real world, and it's being made by somebody who wants it to, to uh, survive a while, it's got to stand up. It's got to support itself in the same way that we do. And uh, so with these stubby little feet, and this, this is anatomically very true to the otter, the only reason the otter can stand up, and it can, although it has a forward body roll, if you've ever seen pictures of an otter, and its little head is offset the way Rona has offset the head. So the whole mass of the head is outside of the line of the body um, is because of the tail, this nice big heavy tail that it uses for swimming. And uh, Rona has given us a, a, a beautifully anatomically precise figure uh, even as she's made all of the, the changes and alterations and done the hybridizing that she's done. And, uh, and I'll talk about that subject later. But it's, this, this is another um, constant through the history, of, especially of figural sculpture, um, of, of making things that are quite anatomically precise, um, Sometimes for the very good reason, a uh, very practical reason, just of wanting it to do what we do, which is to stay erect. And that, that is a, the whole idea of, of the erectness of sculpture is, is an important uh, part of, of uh, the development of modernism. But that, that's another, another subject. And that is also of interest um, to, to Rona um, Brancusi. Um, I'm thinking of specifically as, as sort of the start of a, of a whole line of people um, examining erectness versus um, horizontality. And that all goes back to the, the root of sculpture being the figure, the human figure. Um, let's take a look at the, the monkeys. Rona, in talking about these, invariably goes to the discomfort that they um, create in many viewers, um, and she enjoys that immensely, of course. And, uh, and the uncanny is, is an extremely important part of, of what she does and what she's interested in. But what I like about these, and um, another friend that I, I shared with Rona, uh, a, a brilliant young conservator who uh, tragically died very young, um, a few years ago of, of, um, of cancer at, at 35, um, worked with Rona on these. And uh, Rona is one of, a, of a, an increasing number of sculptors who works directly with a conservator, or a group, in some cases teams of conservators, to, to help them find material solutions for what they want to do. 
And I love thinking about these monkeys, and I love thinking about them in this group of objects, um, each of which shows something about a, a piece of sculpture is the result of a desire to make something butting up against the realities of the materials that are available, the tools that are available, the techniques that are known at any given time. And every one of these is, is an essay in the art of the possible at that moment. And I think to some extent, Verona, the, these monkeys um, you, using the synthetic hair are about doing it just because it could be done. And just to prove that it could be done. And just to extend this history of doing the doable at any given moment in the history of sculpture. And doing it within a tradition. As opposed to doing something. that The amazing thing about Rona, the thing that I love so much about Rona, is that she's constantly working within and against the traditions of sculpture. But always bringing them right up to date. Her, her thinking is hyper-contemporary. But it, it, is, it is informed by 20,000 years worth of techniques, habits, um, ideas, approaches, um, and in some cases, uh, limitations. Now, it's, it's not fair to say that, that any one of these is limited in any way, but it is, it is right to say that it's, it's an expression of uh, what was doable given, given the materials available. So... Um, that, that's something that she, I think, thinks an enormous amount about um, is, is how to, to push the traditions forward um, and, and, and make them um, active and, and living in a, in a contemporary sense. And as weird as these are, um, that's exactly what they do. You know, they're, they're a pointer ahead while they're looking back at the same time. Um, and, an even more graphic example of that is, is Mouse with this enormous head on it. And um, she, she does, when she speaks, drop little hints. Um, and, and every one of those little hints deserves to be exploded a thousand times. Um, in talking about this, she, she's mentioned a, a photograph that she saw in the newspaper. And uh, she actually saw it in an ad from a, a, a group of people, um, fundamentalists, who were horrified by something they had seen and misinterpreted. And it's, it was the image of a mouse, a, a mouse without any hair, with what looked like a human ear growing on its back. Have, has any of you seen that photograph? It's, it was, it's known as the Vacanti mouse. And uh, it was actually produced not far from here, in Boston, by a, a, a brilliant uh, research researcher, uh, two pair of researchers actually, one at MIT and, and one a, a practicing surgeon. And uh, what they were trying to do is figure out how to grow replacement parts for people. Um, now, this was taken to be a, a kind of a, a, a demented uh, form of genetic manipulation people figured that somehow they had manipulated the mouse's genes to have the ear grow on its back and that then the mouse would be killed and the ear would be removed and used as a replacement for somebody missing an ear. The, the mouse had, in fact, been genetically modified, but for, in only two ways. It had been modified to have no hair and it had been modified to not reject foreign tissue. So it had its immune systems repressed. And the thing that looked like an ear on its back was, in fact, a, a biodegradable mold that had been filled with cow cartilage cells. And the idea was to try to get this cow cartilage to grow into the mold and create a, an ear that could be used as a replacement part for people. Um, this image lodged itself deep in, in um, a lot of people's psyches, I think. A lot of you have nodded your heads and seem to remember it. And in, in Rona's, for sure, by way of explaining how this all makes sense, um, there was a, a recent exhibition um, in my neighborhood in, in, uh, in New York 
by a, a very uppity but very interesting uh, alternative exhibition space, which does regular competitions where they invite people to submit curatorial ideas for exhibitions um, from any, any place and any walk of life. And they, they get huge numbers of submissions. And the one they most recently accepted was a trio of plastic surgeons who wanted to exhibit their before and after photographs as art. Hmm and wanted to be treated in the context of the exhibition as artists. And Rona is, as an artist, thinking enormous amount about what uh, new technologies mean and, and new biological technologies, not just new, uh, you know, obviously this, this is inorganic matter, all of it's inorganic. But you can see her thinking about and processing what it's going to mean for sculpture to start incorporating biological ideas. And that, that's a transition to an, the next topic, um, these trees. The, the idea, I just want to talk a little bit about the way Rona works. Um, you know, at, at various points, our, our culture, we get obsessed with... with sort of dominant modalities and uh, sometimes those are industrial and sometimes those are biological and, and we kind of, society veers back and forth between being obsessed with industry and all of its problems but also all of its possibilities and being obsessed with bio, biology and uh, the obsession with that ear on the back of the mouse and genetic manipulation in general and cloning and evolution and all of that obviously is in the, the biological sciences category. Um, industrial design and iPhones and you know all that other stuff or, or a, a great example from the history of sculpture is um, something like um, Duchamp Villon's large horse. Is that an object that people know, can kind of picture? It looks like a cross between uh, a schematized horse and the, the, the drivetrain of a steam engine. And uh, it's been beautifully described as a portrait, not of, or an image, not of a horse, but of horse power as a concept. And uh, so Rona is working in, in what I describe as, as a biological mode. And, and Ron is thinking, and what you see it expressed very well in these trees, um, Ron is thinking is, is a, a kind of a, a fractal geometry thinking. This goes back to that idea of, of high resolvability. You know, what, what, what a fractal, a fractal is, is a, a, a structure that repeats itself is made up of repeated versions of itself. So whether you look at it at one time resolution or at a trillion times resolution, it looks the same. It's a structure made up of identical structures. In other words, it's, it's very cell-like. And the way Rona works is very cell-like. And what's so, again, so interesting about Rona is that she's able to process these concepts in a way that's both traditional and very contemporary. And when, when Rona, uh, Rona frequently cites also as influences the movie The Fly and as well as Terminator. And the, what's the difference between the first Terminator, the T-800, and the Terminator that's in Terminator 2, which is that liquid mercury creature, the T-1000? Well, the difference is that the T-800, the T and Rona knows all of this, the T-800 is a cyborg. It's, it's a metal exoskeleton that's covered in human flesh to create something that kind of looks, kind of acts, and kind of is human-ish. The T-1000 is composed of colonies of nano machines that combine and recombine into any conceivable shape. So it's, it's made up of things that are essentially identical and microscopic. And in a sense, Rona is working with, and, and the reason she likes, she likes the mercury look of this highly polished stainless steel. In a way, if you take Rona's biological ideas and these industrial ideas all back to a, an atomic level, they're all, we're all, it's all composed of the same basic stuff. You know, it's, it's about repeating a cellular structure. 
And in these trees, what she's doing, you know, nature is very modular this way. Division, cell division, redivision, exponential division. Um, that's how trees grow, obviously, that each branch has the possibility to split into multiple branches and multiple branches. Um, and, and that is a, a process that, that de- describes well what Rona does. And, and Rona is not the first artist to do that. And, and I just say a word about, about um, Rodin. Rodin ended up at the end of his career with what he called his anatomical library which was a, a collection of 7,000 parts, 7,000 body parts. And these are hands, arms, heads, feet, legs, e- torsos, every part of the body you can think of, reproduced at every conceivable scale, from little clay modello size all the way up to monumental thinker in front of the library size. And that library he used to combine and recombine parts in a bazillion different ways. Rodin worked modularly. He thought of these parts as parts and then combined them into holes. Not all artists work that way at all. In fact, we, Rodin was so famous, we have hundred, literally hundreds of accounts of people who visited his studio. One of those, as a very young man, as a very young artist, was Matisse, who took some drawings to Rodin because he wanted, as many young artists did, to get an opinion. Am I on the right track? You know, should, should I keep doing this? Should I do something else? Whatever. So Matisse goes, and, and one of the things that he says when he comes away is that um, he, he, he's baffled by the way Rodin works. He said, I could never work the way that guy works. And what he watched Rodin working on was the clothed version of St. John. And Rodin had gone up to a plaster model uh, and pulled the hand out of the sleeve. It had already been long, long since, the original hand had long since been lopped off. And Rodin had been trying different hands, different versions of hands in different positions, twisting it around, playing with it a little bit, and he would pull it off and he would rework a little something on it, you maybe maybe sharpening up the veins on the back of the hand, and then he'd jam it back in there, swivel it around. And Matisse said, you know, when I when I look at a, a, an object, like a body, I, I think of it as a whole, as a whole unit. And I conceive it as a whole. And I, I can't imagine how this guy works with this crazy bin of parts. Well, Rona is one of those who, and Rona has said that one of her ambitions as an artist is to build her own anatomical library. And uh, that's, that's a little bit of what you can see beginning over there. And she does have a small one, but uh, I know she would like to see it get up to that, that same sort of crazy range. Um, and the, the thing, though, is... In order to do that, and, and, and uh, this, this gets us to part of the, the title of, of the talk, which is the idea, R- Rona is a master modeler, she's a master carver, and she's a master assembler. And th- those are the three big dominant modes of, of sculpture making up until fairly recently, when the, just the replication of industrial objects of one kind or another um, which is, is now one of the dominant modes. But in the past, the person who really pioneered all of those three things in a, in a single working methodology was Rodin. And uh, Rona is sort of updating it uh, for the 20th, 21st century. She's using different materials and she's working more efficiently. Rodin, for example, had three full-time mold makers which are people who, and anytime he'd get to a state where he felt like something was in pretty good shape, at whatever size it was at, he would have a mold made of it and have plaster casts made of it. And he would have enough casts made that he could set some aside and, and chop some up and work on one as a new sort of starting point for an original piece of sculpture. So he always had... Any given sculpture was always in multiple different states. Um, and Rona is the same way. And, I mean, th- what's amazing about a, a piece like this is that th- this is constructed, this, this object. You know, it, it looks very much like a tree. And she worked with a tree, and obviously it's modeled on a tree, 
But ultimately, what's here is Rona's work. And going back to this whole idea of connoisseurship, it takes an enormous amount of technical skill, and it, and it takes technical habituation to have the skill set that's necessary to make the transitions between parts that she makes so that they seem organic. And that, that's part of that whole idea of working biologically. And it's, it's actually, it's a rich idea. Um, and it's an idea that's, that's deeply, again, deeply rooted in the history of art. Um, this, this panel is wonderful because if, if you, it's obviously, it's a, it's a lineage, right? It's a family tree, a way of, of recording um, a, a family tree. But if you look at where the tree is rooted, it should bring something immediately to mind which are images of Adam. And images of Adam reclining in, in many of the most famous, like from the doors of the Baptist, Baptistry in Florence, for example, is a nice reclining Adam with uh, God very helpfully extracting the rib from his side, right, to make Eve. So the idea of Eve is the material creation. As, as material, she comes from this bit of bone in Adam. Um, and here the, that same idea expressed. Well, R Rona, again, as I said, in, in a way is, is uniting organic and inorganic um, in, in a kind of what I, I would describe in a way her material as like a, um, a stem cell for sculpture making. And, and you, you know, it would be easy to look at something like the, the limbs on otter the one without the human hand, and the feet, and the feet on fox, and, and uh, all, all of these sort of poorly described, seemingly poorly described animal limbs. You could describe them as, as vestigial, right? They almost look like limbs look when they don't develop properly, or when they're at a very early stage of development. Well, th think of those as comp being composed of this biological mercury-like substance that has the ability to grow into anything. The way a stem cell, the theory of, a biological theory of stem cells, right, is, is that you're, you're getting the, the root material of all of our parts. And if we can just figure out how to get stem cells to develop the ways we want them to develop, that we can make anything, meaning any kind of biological part. Now, um, Another way in which um, Rona is pulling the, the te technical history of sculpture through into the present and, and in a way putting her flag in the ground and, and laying down a milestone and a marker for future artists um, is by making the technique visible. And th this is something that, again, Rodin is, is a famous... Um, um, proponent of, one of the first people to leave mold marks, visible mold marks, on finished sculpture. So you know when you're looking at, say, a cast of Eve or a cast of the Thinker or of any of the other iconic sculptures, you'll see a, a network of lines running across the surface. Sometimes they're Sometimes they've been chased away, but very often they're there. Sometimes they're heavier, sometimes they're lighter, but those are places where the plaster has seeped just a little bit into the cracks between pieces of a piece mold. And he's left them. Usually those are chased off, either in the bronze or, or um, earlier. Um, it all depends on the, the, the method by which the, the cast is being made. But um, he became famous for it. It's something that Matisse did. And it beca this became one of the tropes of modernism. Right? Mo modernism in, in all the arts is defined by self-aware art making. You know, the, the uh, modernist works of art are technically self-aware. So the idea of the, the canvas that's clearly a flat canvas because of the way the paint is applied, or the sculpture that's obviously a sculpture because you can see the seams, um, the sort of Frankensteinian seams again. Well, um, Ron has done the same thing by leaving, um, the, the way this hand was scaled, 
and again, this, this is, goes back to that idea of resolution and of scale not being the same thing as size and of scale being really, really complicated. Um, some, a sculpture that works perfectly at this size, at Modelo size, doesn't automatically work at 10 times that size. It's, and there's a certain amount of alchemy involved. Why not? Why, why don't the same physical relationships between the parts of a sculpture work at any size? They just don't for some reason. Some of it has to do with the environment in which they're shown. That obviously affects the sculpture, sculpture immensely. But it's also an internal problem. And it's, it's one that sculptors who worked as Rodin did um, with uh, scaling machines um, were very aware of. And, and often, once something was scaled, it had to be reworked and tweaked to make it work. And Rona had to do exactly the same thing. So th this hand comes from a computer scan of a hand. And then um, a thermoplastic version was made. made. Do, do you all, you're all familiar with rapid prototyping? So this, this is three-dimensional scanning and production. So imagine um, sort of a, a liquid bath and uh, based on a three-dimensional scan, a com computer drives a laser and the laser sinters this liquid into a hard, basically it cures it into a hard material, one microscopically thin layer at a time. And so it rises up out of the goo, as it were, a fully formed piece of sculpture, all driven by computers, all based on 3D scans. And th this now is very, very common. The machines are getting cheaper and cheaper. Eventually, I'll be able to buy one on eBay, I'm sure. Um, we all will. We'll all have them. But right now, it's, it's, um, the people who use them are like um, Formula One teams use them because they change the shapes of their cars for every track. Uh, and they change them week to week anyway, just trying to find, improve aerodynamics. They use rapid prototyping machines because you can very quickly take a CAD drawing and have a three-dimensional model of it. Well, so Roan has done the same thing, only she found what we all find. If you take a, a photograph at a particular resolution, say a fairly low resolution, and then you blow it up on your computer, what happens? It pixelates, right? So it, it loses all of its sharpness, but also all the edges go wacky because every smooth edge is actually made up of a jagged edge. And it's just when you're looking at a jagged edge from far enough away, it looks smooth. Well, the same thing is true with the texture of the hand. It basically, when she scaled it up, it pixelated. And so she had to go back in. And again, this is the difference between an artist like Rona, who is deeply, deeply serious about craft, and somebody else. And, and uh, somewhere like uh, de Cordova, actually, you know, there's some wonderful things at de, de Cordova. But there are also some uh, 3D modeled and generated, computer generated sculpture there that has that kind of blobby quality of cheap computer animation. And, you can, and, and that may be desired in some cases. Uh, that is one way of showing the way it was made. But uh, Rona is, is, even at once she scales, wants to reachieve that same fine texture. But you can see she's left in a certain amount of the stratification. And so it's, like I said, it, in, in a way, this is a nod to Rodin. This is a nod to those mold marks that are visible on sculpture. It's a way of saying, okay, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm, I'm going to make my process visible. But here you'll be able to tell that it's, it's, a, it's a completely new process. You know, it's a totally contemporary process for our, our moment. This is Cat, by the way. All right, so sort of want to bring everything um, back, back around a little bit. Um, and talk a, just a little generally about the hybrids because in, in all of the sort of the tech and sculpture talk, it's, it's easy to lose track of, of meaning. Um, you know, meaning, big air quotes. Um, but like I said, Rona's pieces don't just resolve well at the level of structure. Um, the best sculpture is sculpture that somehow 
integrates uh, metaphor meaning and materiality and technique in a way that's seamless and coherent um, and self-reinforcing. And uh, so I just w I want to end sort of by talking a little bit generally about the hybrids um, and a about dog. Um, the hybrid in, in sculpture, in, in the history of sculpture and, and of art in general, has, has generally, they've generally been used to create a, a sense of the other. You know, either it was a way to characterize something that people didn't understand, the gods, and to try to describe something about the way they were different or, and or superior, about their superior powers or their particular powers or their particular associations, or it was used as a way to uh, other a, um, an enemy. And uh, going back to ancient Greece again, because that's where a lot of this stuff is rooted for us, um, the centaur in, in ancient Greek, Greek mythology um, was used as a political tool. And centaurs were used as a tool to do a couple of things. Um, but basically, it was a way of... Uh, uh, centaurs were a metaphor for barbarians. And to the Greeks, barbarians were anybody who weren't Greek. Um, and <laughs> not to put too fine a point on it. And uh, you see on, on lots of attic vases, I, I went and saw, took a look to see if there were any here, and there aren't. But very common on attic vases, you'll see battles between centaurs and Amazons. Well, those Amazons in those vases are dressed like Persians. Persia obviously was the great enemy of Greece in that proto-classical period and the early classical period. And the, the, the sort of the apocalyptic events that ended up creating what we think of as classical Greece both had to do with uh, wars with the Persians. Well, centaurs and Amazons dressed like Persians together were a, were a sort of a double hit against the Persians in a way of, of by the way, in those, those images, the Amazons are always running away from the centaurs. And it's a way of, of proving, both by making them all women, Amazons, and there, there was an island of, of Amazons, sort of, but it, it was a way of, of showing them to be cowards and of showing them to be, you know, the whole idea of the centaur is, is that it, there, there's a, an excessive level of bestiality. You know, that they're not fully human. That they're, they're um, yes, they have human heads, but they're still ruled by that animal body. To too, too, too great an extent, the, the Greeks would say. You know, moderation in all things. Um, hyperlogical, rational. Um, so th there's another sort of related idea. Oh, and I just want to mention, there's, there is a whole tradition um, in the very, very early centaurs in Greek sculpture uh, the front half of the centaur is all human. So the, it, pic, picture a centaur. Everyone picture a centaur. You're all picturing the lower half of a horse with four horse legs and a horse chest and the upper torso starting somewhere, depending on how uh, modest the artist is, you know, to, starting somewhere around the navel. Uh, and then the top, the torso, obviously, of a human being. Well, those earliest centaurs in Greek art, um, the front half of the horse cutting off right at the, the, where a horse's neck would meet the body is human. So the front legs are human legs. And the whole torso is human. And uh, dog is wonderful for a million reasons. But one of the reasons it's wonderful is because uh, Rona has pulled human arms into the dog's body. And you, you can see in most of the sculptures she doesn't do that. And in most of them, the body is, is fully animal um, and, the, and the hand is human. But in this case, and this is an earlier work, and, and in fact, she, you can tell, you know she played around with the idea because in the, the earliest dogs, um, the arms weren't polished. So she, re in rethinking it, she incorporated, reincorporated the human arms into the dog body um, in a way, again, that's not dissimilar to those earliest centaurs. And it can, it just, it's a, sort of a, a demonstration of the, the, the fineness of detail with which she's thinking these things through. Um, 
There's another idea, the idea of dualism, that animal-human hybrids have been used to, to explain or, or to think about. And that's, that's the idea that we, we have a soul you know, and we have a body, and that those are two separate things, and that they live together, but that they're fundamentally separate. This is an idea that's fundamental to almost all religions um, and is a, is a very important philosophical concept. Um, and animal-human hybrids are, are one way of expressing dualism. And, um, and uh, going back to Rodin, there's a, a great example. Uh, Rodin made a sculpture of a centaurus, um, and it is the kind of the, the, what we think of now as the iconic um, configuration with a horse's body and then a human torso. But it's a female torso, and it's trying to escape the horse's body. And it's, it's a, as he so often did, it's a reuse of another figure. The human torso is the reuse of a, a prodigal son, which is a, a torso doing this. And he's taken the torso uh, down to the hip, and it looks like she's literally flying out of the horse's body. And it's a really nice twist, but it's a, it's a quite gendered twist. Uh, because the idea of a, a female... Um, centaurus or a female human part that's trying to escape her physical reality. And Roan is turning that idea on its head. And she's turning that idea on its head in, in all of these hybrid, animal-human hybrid sculptures. Um, there, there is a, a very, very large gender component to these, um, which is, is interesting and, and quite brilliant, I think. Um, I talked about it a little bit in, in the Pine Martin and the Cougar, um, but it's, it's here in Dog as well. And she, she, she is, to some extent, the anti-Sphinx. You know, she's an anti-femme fatale. Part of what's neat about, about her sculptures, uh, about these animal sculptures, is looking at the animals she's chosen to start with. You know, they, it's not a horse. It's not a lion. There's the cougar, obviously. But in most cases, these are, are modest, quite modest animals. Um, they're not domestic exactly, but uh, they're at a, a, a very different register than uh, the sort of the macho hybrids that we associate with gods um, and, and again, this, this process of, of othering. Um, there's one more component to these that I want to end with, and, and that's another incredibly important tradition that, that Rona is very connected to and, and thinks a lot about. Um, and that's the, the idea of, and it sort of uh, goes through everything I've been talking about, is, is the re Italian Renaissance idea of design. That uh, il disegno is what Vasari called it, and il disegno became a, a sort of the apex of the idea of artistic creativity. And design was a, a combination. It, it technically just means drawing, but uh, in a way, of the, the better um, translation, English translation is or conceptual translation is design, and it unites together the hand, the eye and the imagination. And design is a way of looking at and parsing things that have already been made, but it's also the way of conceiving things that haven't yet been made. It's impossible if you think about it. Every one of us has a creative imagination. My mother is a terrific cook. She tells a joke all the time about French cooking, that uh, the French put onions on to caramelize and then decide what's for dinner. Right. Well, that's, that's a way, it's a habitual way of cooking. It's a way of, of thinking about what food is and what you start with, what a basic building block of, of food making is. Well, that, that is a kind of design. And, and the tech, obviously, I'm you know, not getting into, the, into cooking techniques, but being able to think through the technique that you know you know, each one of us has built something. What do you think about when you go about building something? Well, what you want to build is conditioned by how you're able to work and how you're used to working. You know, this goes back to that idea of being able to work as a modeler, as a carver. That is, those two things, by the way, used to be diametrically opposed. There was, for a long time in sculpture making, there was a war 
between people who made things by taking material away, the carvers, and people who made sculpture objects by putting stuff together, you know, by modeling out of nothing. And then to that was added assemblage, the idea of making sculpture by taking disparate objects and combining them together. Each one of those is a way of looking at construction. And uh, Rona has made herself uh, an expert in all three modes, which is very unusual, and combined them together. And that's part of what all of these sculptures are about. The head and the hand. You know, that's what it's all about for, for the artist. Arcing across, like some kind of electrical magic, the body. Somehow making it across all of the confusions uh, that are inherent in the body. And, and it's, it's the ability to, you know, for the Italians, uh, for, in the Italian Renaissance, that idea of design, the ability to draw, what that is, is output. So it's, it's a matter of being able to take in and see shapes and forms um, in a way that allows you to output them. But you have to have the technique to output. And that's, that's what a lot of artists don't have now. For a lot of artists, their output is outsourced. And, and the reason why I've been talking about Rona in the context of, of connoisseurship is because Rona um, has made herself capable, well, I'll just I'll put it in her words um, and, and end with this. Rona says, I think with my hands. And that, that sounds like a kind of a, a, an artist... Um, It sounds like a, a, I'm at the end of a long talk. What's the word I'm looking It sounds like a cliche. Yeah, and it is a cliche in a way. But for Rona, it's true. And, and that, that in, in a way, is what all of these, these animal-human hybrids are both proof of and is part of their subject matter. That uh, for Rona as an artist, she actually does think with her hands, which means that she has the technique and the vision to input and output what she envisions, what she has in her mind, in her ima- is able to conceive in her imagination. Thank you. And I guess questions. If, uh, if anybody has any questions, yeah, please. Um, on the sculpture, <coughs> the body surface reflects the viewer. Yes. The hand and the head. The human part, do not. Would you comment on that, please? Sure. I mean, I, there, are, there are as many ways to read all of these things as there are people in this room. So, you know, my take is just, is just my take. But, um, I mean, I, I would say that she is, to, to use slightly uh, jargony, our historical speak, that she's implicating the viewer in a part of the sculpture. Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, you don't, she, I, th- I think Rona thinks that you don't need to, you already have a pretty high opinion of your human part. And I, I, think, I think part of what Rona is trying to do, and it's, it's part of what I was talking about with the idea of domesticating, in a way, the concept of the animal-human hybrid. And, and this, is, this goes back to that idea I, I used in the, the write-up, the uh, concept that she sometimes talks about of slow food. Um, that it's, it's, she is trying to, in a way, um, reacclimating us to our own physicality, our own, our own animalness, our own mammalness, um, and that, that's part of the feminization of, uh, of these animal-human hybrids that she's, she's undertaking. So I think she's, she is, by making uh, the body reflect... Um, and, the, and obviously, that this owes a huge debt to Brancusi, um, which she acknowledges very, very frankly. Um, you know, we're, we we're forced to look at another part of ourselves that maybe she thinks we underestimate. Thank you. Sure. I just had a couple of comments. Yeah. There's a book by I think William Tucker uh, that actually talks about Brancusi, but he also talks about Rodin. And one of the things I thought that was so interesting in it, which actually telling you more about Rodin was that he would start with, the, with his, the feet and work on the feet and, and have the clay dry and move up. So he's dealing with gravity also. So I think that that's really interesting so that these felt human, humans like that being erect and then the fact that he's a, using an assemblage. So I didn't know that he did that. Himself. That's a great comment yeah. because it, it, it part, this is a point of pride for Rodin. Yeah. Rodin did not like to use armatures. Yeah. 
You know, an armature is a way of, of cheating, obviously, because you can build onto it. But Rodin, even, even with standing figures, liked them, even at life size, um, liked them to, and he worked in clay, obviously. His b beginning medium was clay. Um, he liked them to be able to stand on their own. Do you know that book because it's written by a sculptor? Yeah, of course. I mean, the it's... Best. a and, and that boy, that says something about about sculpture in general and, yeah. and the problems. And uh, what what for me, Rona is one of a teeny tiny handful of artists who are trying to redress. Um, that's a really old book. Yeah, no, it's a good it's book. A, it's a, you know almost what seventy years old, and um, it's still William one of the best books on. It's their first edition, I think, is is older than that. William Tucker, he's a sculptor. Yeah, okay. yeah, he's an he's yeah. an old sculptor. He's old. He's yeah, an old sculptor now. Um, okay. but anyway, it's an yeah. old book, but yeah, it's no, it's, it's but still it's, one yeah. of the best things out there. Yeah, yeah. Because it's one of the few to deal with those places where meaning and technique cross over. Mm -hmm. Also, in that book, you know, this old book, uh, another old book, Psychology of Art, they talk about the body and the hands and the head being mental and the different parts of the body and how dancers use it, but. I mean, for me, one of the most exciting things was gesture, because I think gesture is so important in film and, and, and the whole idea of uh, kind of a not looking contextually at history. I thought that was really interesting about the show, too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, uh, the, the non-contextual nature is, is really important, and the, the quote on the wall is, is really a good one. Um, too, for putting some context around that, because this, this obviously is an easy show to criticize from a certain point of view, um, because it seems in a in a there seems to be a certain amount of um, you could charge it with a certain kind of cultural imperialism, yeah, which is not at all what Ron is doing. In fact, she's after the exact opposite effect. Um, but it's how like children experience art; they go into a museum. And they, they react. They associate to their directly, so, yes. Okay, this is why it's there, this is historically why it's there. And I think that's really interesting. There's a new neurological basis for that, too, which is um, there, there are some art historians at Columbia who are working with the Center for the Mind. Um, and they're, they're working on um, something called the mirror neurons. And the, these are the, um, the neurons that are in the brain that are thought to make it possible. You know, if, if you, I see you do a pose, um, like, let's say you, you raise one arm like that. In my brain, the exact same neurons that fire in your brain when you raise their arm fire in my brain when I watch you raise your arm. Really? Yeah. Wow. So, and they're called mirror neurons. Oh, yeah. And um, there, there are a bunch of art historians who are fascinated by this because they think that it's, it's uh, you know, these, these are, are people who are partial to sculpture. And they believe that it's one of the advantages of sculpture over painting that there, there is a level, there are uh, levels of degree of how well these neurons fire. And uh, there, there are some people who believe that the neurons fire more when you look at a piece of sculpture because it's three dimensional than, say, looking at somebody doing that in a painting. But that's all part of what you were talking about, you know, this idea of embodiment. And any other questions? Well, th thank you again. Pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Nathan. Thank you all for coming. They probably died. <laughs>